This is session 12. First Samuel chapter 21. <clears throat> now what has happened here, we're going to look at this a little more detailed next week, Lord willing, from verses uh, 21, I mean from verses 1 to 9. But what's happening is in verse 1 that David has now fled from Saul. And he goes to the city of Nob, to Ahimelech the priest, the high priest. And he was afraid when he met David. He goes, what are you doing alone and no one is with you? And David tells him a lie, and we'll look at that in a little more detail next week. And then what he says is, he goes, I need help from you. And so he, give, he says, I don't have, I was in such a hurry, I didn't have time to get weapons. And I didn't have time to get food, etc. So verse 9 Verse 8 and 9, he says, I was on a, the king's business, business, it was urgent, so they give him food and they give him, out of the trophy case, Goliath's sword. I mean, Goliath was nine foot nine, nine foot nine, imagine. Nearly ten foot tall, he had this massive sword. And it's right there in the trophy case, if you will, in the, in the city of priests, in the city of Nam. There's 85 priests that are there. And again, we'll look at more detail on that later, but I just wanted to contextualize what's going to happen next. So he takes Goliath's sword and then takes off. <clears throat> Verse 10. David arose and fled that day from before Saul. He went to Achish, the king of Gath. Very interesting story. He goes to Achish, king of Gath. Now, the Philistines was... Uh, a coalition of five major cities made up the Philistine nation. It's not very, it's not very big, but it, it, as far as nations went in those days, it was a, an average-sized nation. It was made up of five cities. Each city had its own king, and a coalition of them together established the Philistine nation. And they were on the west side of, of the nation of Israel, right there on the Mediterranean Sea, down towards the south. And so one of the cities is Gath. And so Achish is the king of Gath. He's one of the five kings. It was from Gath, it was from that very city that Goliath was the champion. David has Goliath's sword and he goes to Gath with Goliath's sword. He's not putting that together yet. I tell you, when, when fear gets a hold of you, one and one doesn't equal two. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Now David's again about, maybe he's, I don't know, maybe 25, 26 years old at this time. It's hard to say. He's in his mid-twenties. And they have been calling David the king instead of Saul, who's in his sixties. And they're saying, no, this is the real king. I mean, that's, that's an interesting story already. That they're, they say, yeah, we know Saul's the king, but really David is the one the whole nation's following. And David might have said, that's my problem. That's my problem. And then, of course, the prophet of God could have whispered in his heart and says, no, David, your problem is you have need of a deeper foundation because you're calling yet in the future. Is he not the king? of the land of Israel. Did they not sing of him to one another in the dances? Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands. I mean, that thing wasn't just on the top number one song in Israel. It was the number one song in the Philistine nations. They knew of the young virgins of Israel dancing in the streets, singing songs about young David that angered Saul. They knew about it. I mean, this thing was a number one song for a long time. It's years later now. This is some years later. David took these words to heart. And he was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. He goes, oh no, they know who I am. So what he did is, verse uh, 13, he does something very, very undignified. He kicks into a fear mode again. He's very much afraid. Fear is dominating his heart. The, the thing that we learn from the life of David is that you can be a godly man or woman and still have some moments where the godliness is hard to see. A godly man is not just a person who never, ever fails. It's a person where the rule of their life is they're given to God. This is a, 
this is a dark moment in David's life. Fear lays hold of him. He changed his behavior before the king and before the king's court is, is the implication. He pretended madness in their hands. He scratched on the doors of the gate. He let saliva fall down his beard. And Achy said to his servants, look. It's like, look at that. That's the guy that killed Goliath. Look at that. That word look, there's a lot to it. Look. You see, the man's insane. The guy has gone mad. He's crazy. Why have you brought a madman to me? Why? This, see, he's no threat to me. A man that will stoop to that indignity, I'm not worried about him. Have I need of a madman that you've brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Fascinating story. Because of the bigger picture, because he ends up going into Achish's house and becoming like his son later on in, ch in chapter 27. That, that's the amazing part of the story. So David's rationale is this. He says, Saul is a coward. The Spirit of the Lord's not on him. Saul is afraid. He's actually afraid of war. He's a man of war, but he doesn't have courage anymore. He's fearful with this, this evil spirit on him, etc. And so David said, Saul will chase me forever till he kills me. I'll cross over the line and go to the Philistines, and Saul will never cross that line. He will be too afraid to seek for me. His hatred is only superseded by his fear of the Philistines. His hatred of me is the only thing greater is his fear of the Philistines. So I will go into the hand of the Philistines to get Saul to leave me alone. This is part of David's despair. Because remember back in chapter 20, verse 3, he says, I know I'm going to die. David's operating in compromise. He's operating in fear. He was not supposed to do this. He's famous over there. He's got, he has Goliath's sword in his side. That is just amazing. And what happens, it, it's really hard to know exactly what's happening, but if you take chapter 27 into account, David's motive was to win Achish's favor. Surely in chapter 27 it's clear when he goes to Gath the second time, he wins Achish's favor and becomes like a son to him. Matter of fact, he becomes Achish's favorite person in the world. The favor of the Lord is on David, and even when he's in the wrong place, it's still working. The favor of the Lord is on him. And that's an interesting principle. I've seen sometimes the anointed of the Lord get into sin, get completely out of their calling. I don't mean getting to sin because they're out of their calling. Get into perverse sins and therefore they're out of their calling. They have to lay it down and go into the business arena. I, I know, I literally know five or six guys that have done this and make millions of dollars instantly. You say, how does this happen? There's just the favor of the Lord is upon them. Now they'll give an account for it on the last day. Whatever measure of favor God has put upon you in this life, you will answer for it on the, on the last day. And I don't mean that you'll go to hell for it, but I'm saying that the Lord, when He... That the judgment seat is the great equalizer. You know, when Billy Graham stands before the Lord, as, as I've said before, the Lord's not going to go, Billy Graham, oh my, look at this! You led thousands to my son. That's not going to happen. He's going to say, Billy Graham, you've led millions, but look at what I gave you. And we will measure your life in the, in the equation of what I gave unto you. And so the idea that more is better isn't necessarily an equation that holds up on the judgment seat. What is better is love. Love is better, not more impact. Love is better because the impact is given by the Lord. But anyway, I've seen people get into sin, have to lay their, their, their ministry down and step over to another arena a business and instantly make a tremendous amount of money with favor everywhere that they touch, with everything they touch. I go, Lord, this is truly amazing. And again, I imagine the Lord says something like, they will give an account for everything that I've given unto them. And really what I measure is the growth in love, not how much they made or how easy or how hard. I do it by love, by voluntary love. And so what happens? He goes over there to, to hide. 
I think that he's he's trying to get Achish's favor because he believes it can happen because he does it in chapter 27. But the men around him completely are alarmed. They go, wait a second. This is the champion of Israel, number one. I mean, he killed the champion of the Philistines. And number two, wait, it wasn't just too long ago when he crossed the lines and killed 200 of our soldiers to give a dowry to King Saul. The other guy, you know, one guy might have said, yeah, I was there. I escaped when he had to... He only had to get a hundred, but he killed two hundred of us. <laughs> Him and his little band of men. And David's going, no, no, that wasn't me. No. And the guy goes, yeah, it was you. I was right there by you. You're the one that did that. And David goes, oh, no. I don't know. It's still a mystery to me in verse 13 why when he pretends madness, Achish out of just vengeance and anger doesn't kill him for killing the 200. And David's won a lot of Philistine wars of little skirmishes. He's won a lot of those too in the last number of years. I don't know why Achish didn't kill him in the natural. I mean, I know from the favor of the Lord he, he didn't. But for some reason, Achish connects in his mind, this man is no threat to me. If he's willing to stoop to this indignity... He's lost all of his abilities to impact me in a negative way. And maybe he's a bigger trophy that we've conquered him this way than killing him. I don't know what, Saul, what Achish's reasoning was for not killing a man that did more harm to him than any man in their history up to now. But he does it. And he dismisses him and he says, no, you can't, you can't live in my house. You can't be a part of my house. Because that was obviously an issue. And again, in chapter 27, that is the issue. And David succeeds. Chapter 22, verse 1. David therefore departed from there and escaped to the, escaped to the cave of Adullam. Adullam is a city of which there was a famous cave outside the city called the cave of Adullam. We'll look at that later. I just want you to see that he escaped. He departed from there, I mean, and, and uh, escapes to the uh, cave of Adullam. Then in verse 5... The prophet Gad says to David, Do not stay in the strongholds. Depart and go into the land of Judah. Go into the land of Judah. So what the prophet is saying to him, now there's three prophets in David's life, just for the record. We're not going to develop this in a great way in this course, but Samuel, when David is young, an old prophet Samuel, when he's young, then Gad is a contemporary. He's a contemporary with David. He's about his age. He's with him all the days from his youth straight through. You know, I imagine when David's 25, 26, he's probably 25, 26. He's maybe a little bit older. It's hard to say, but he's with David even at the end. So we know that unless he lived to be real, you know, extremely old. And then Nathan was a prophet. When David was an older king, he was a younger prophet. So David had an old prophet when he was young a peer age prophet, and then when he was an older king, he had a younger prophet. And those are the three prophets in David's uh, reign over Israel, or the three prominent prophetic voices. But anyway, this prophet Gad, a, uh, a peer, tells him, he says, God says, go to Judah. That's a very significant, very significant prophecy. Go to where the heat is and stay there. And the Lord tells Gad, I mean, David tells Gad, a dally, Judah? I, wait, I mean, Ju Judah's not that big. He's got 3,000 soldiers. I, I can't go to Judah. Stay in Judah. The Lord will protect you. It's the same thing to Peter. Peter, get out of the boat. Getting out of the boat, walking on the water, was the same thing as staying in Judah. St going to Judah was getting out of the comfort zone, needing God to display His power to deliver David, because Judah was trouble for it was big trouble for David. So the word of the Lord comes by special revelation. Stay in Judah. Go there and stay there. Is the meaning of it. So David goes there for a little while. Turn to chapter 27. David said in his heart, verse 1, I know I'm going to die one of these days by the hand of Saul. No, David, don't do this. He's only 16 months out. From God killing Saul. God's the one that killed Saul when he was 70 years old. When David was 30 and Saul was 70. Saul was 40 years older than David. 
But this, he's 16 months out. Now, he doesn't know he's 16 months out. But if you just put the scripture with the scripture, you know he's just about a year and a half away from being king over Judah and then eventually being king over Israel seven years later than after that. David's a year and a half out and he said, he's, losing, he's wavering. He says, this is getting so wearisome. This is so wearisome. He's 28 and a half years old right now. He says, I don't know, I'm going to die. This old 70-year-old king is going to kill me. I know he's, he's, uh, he's about at the end of his reign, but he's going to kill me before it's over. There's nothing better for me. Listen to this. This David, what are you doing? This is, this is the true David. He's in a bad moment again. There's nothing better for me than I should speedily escape, disobey the prophet of God, and go to the, to the land of the Philistines. I'm adding the disobey. Saul will despair of looking for me, and I will escape out of his hands. Gad's with him. Gad even goes with him back over to, uh, to uh, the Philistine land. Gad says, my, uh, it's not recorded, but I believe Gad, who really received the Lord, of the Lord, says, David, you can't go back to Gad. You have to stay in Judah. No, I can't. I'm going back. And this story, again, is a fascinating story. And we'll look at that in the, in the next couple of weeks. He tells, he goes back to Achish, second time, now it's a couple of years later, and lies to him uh, about three or four times here, gets caught in some of his lies. His city gets burned to the ground. His all the wives of the 600 of David's now army is grown to 600. All the wives and the children have been taken away as captives by the Amalekites. And David's 600 men are, are thinking about killing David. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a fantastic story, especially because he lived. But we'll look at that later. But I just want you to know he went back there and lied to Gath and sold his bill of goods and, 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 and Ach- I mean, lied to Achish. And Achish put him in his house as a son. And it looked like everything was working for a while. Okay. Go to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. David had some pretty big blunders, but the power of David's life was his, his confidence in God's mercy to come back time after time after time. The one thing that David never lost heart hold of was God delighted in the people that would come back to him, no matter what they did, and say, God, I repent, I'll walk away from this. And that is the hallmark, in my opinion, of David's life. We think of David as the great worshiper. I think of David as the, as the man with unusual confidence in the mercy of the Lord. That facet of God's beauty, His mercy. He saw the Lord more than as merciful, but he saw the beauty, of, I mean, the mercy of the Lord in, a, in an unprecedented way. That is what made David a worshiper. David was a worshiper because of what he saw and what he experienced as a weak man before a good God. Psalm 34, look at the top. Psalm of David, the title. When David pretended madness before Abimelech, who drove him away when he departed. Now, Abimelech is the royal name, and Achish is the family name. This is Achish. It's when David is faking madness. It's not a mistake, It's the, because kings sometimes have four or five names. Abimelech would have been... Abimelech would have been his royal name. Achish would have been his family name. So Psalm 34 was written after David faces his fears. When he goes to Gath both times, he goes in fear that his life is, that God isn't going to keep his word to him. He goes in compromise because he doesn't believe God. But the second time, it's deliberately defying the word of Gad, the prophet, to, to go to Judah. And the idea is to stay in Judah because he's going to be king over Judah in about a year and a half after this, but he, he loses heart and, he's, and he goes over to, uh, to Achish again. This psalm could be called David facing his fears and finding the Lord. So it's a psalm about the fear. And David writes under the anointing of the Spirit to tell you some of his journey and some of what he learned in facing his fear because he's in a time of great compromise. He yields and recovers and tells us what he thinks about God. Now, there's two basic fears 
well, there's maybe a hundred fears, but there's two that, that are David is constantly talking about. His fear of man, number one, and his fear of calamity, number two. The fear of man, I, when I think of the fear of man, I think of the, of the social fear of man, of getting, of receiving the displeasure of somebody we care about. That's what I mean by the fear of man. And David references the fact that he didn't want to yield to the popular opinion. He didn't want to just become a man-fearing, man-pleasing person. And the second fear that he talks about, even more prominent, was the fear of calamity, that he'd actually be killed or harm would come to him. There's other fears besides those, but those are the two main fears David talks about. I'd say in our society, the fear of man, of just pleasing people and disobeying God because we don't want somebody to think bad of us, is a, of a, is a more prominent reality than a calamity destroying our lives. Most of us don't live in a, in a present tense fear of calamity. Sometimes in a season of, of, of our lives, sometimes people will think that, but typically it's fear of man that is, is, a, is the real Goliath before this culture. Verse 11 tells us David is speaking this to his children. These lessons are lessons he taught in his home. He spoke them to his children and he spoke them to everyone, everyone else. Verse 11, he's saying, this, this is my curriculum of what I teach people about fear. If you want to really develop a theology of liberation from fear, I believe you can find it in the 22 verses in Psalm 34. I believe it's a Holy Spirit prescription of how to walk free from fear. I've never really developed it and don't know that I ever will, but somebody who God has called to this ministry of touching people's fears in a real, real focused way, I want to challenge you to study everything you can study on Psalm 34. You, you would be fascinated as to what the implications are in line upon line, because he states in verse 11, this is what I teach my family. This is what I lay line upon line, these, go these doctrines, these concepts of what I discovered to walk free from fear, because David really did walk free from fear in the, in the latter end of his life. I don't, when I mean free from fear, I don't mean he never had an impulse of it, but it never dominated him at the end. David was fearless as humans go at the end. The last, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, he was fearless. He knows about overcoming fear. He had little residues of it, undoubtedly, but it wasn't something that was a major issue in his life. And I mean, he was going out to war all the time. I mean, you know, some of you saw Braveheart. The war, I mean, you know, when they like hit you. You're in trouble. I mean, you go to war. He went to war all the time. He was fearless. And I looked at that and I said, man, where's the Novocaine, you know? <laughs> that's, that's trouble, man. And, and, uh, and I believe this is what David taught uh, uh, the 400 that grew to 600. His, uh, his you know, the, the guys that were around him, because they're with him. They're with him, especially after he comes, goes to Gath the second time. The first time they're not with him because they gather to him after he leaves Gath the first time. They gather to him 400, it grows to 600, and then he takes them all back to Gath with him the second time. This is what's going on. Again, he's been running from Saul. Now he had to face the Philistines. He figured out he was the guy that killed the 200 guys for the dowry. He's the one that killed Goliath. He's standing. He says, man, I have had some serious fears. A general outline of, the, of Psalm 34. The first ten verses is his testimony. He tells you what he experienced. Verses 1 to 10, testimonial. Verses 11 to, to 22, it's his teaching. It's his actual doctrine. It's his, it's his line upon line of what he taught others. Verse 1 to 10 would be his song. It was the song he sang in his heart before God Verses 11 to 22 would have been the sermon that he gave. It was what he brought others into, line upon line. Verse 6, he refers to himself as a poor man. And he is poor. I mean, he doesn't have any money. I mean, he's really having it an economically. He's been a very, very difficult. We don't think of his economic problems, but he had them. He really had no income. He was living off the land as a fugitive. He was poor in that he, he disobeyed the Lord. He was poor in that he lost all of his friends and his family, in essence. I believe he was poor because fear was dominating his heart. 
So he's lost his income, he's lost his friendships, he's lost his fresh walk with God. He says, this poor man cried to the Lord. I don't have any money, I've lost my friends, I feel like I've lost my calling. I've lost my walk, or at least my freshness in the Lord. The fear's dominating me, I'm disobeying Him. Because this reality, I believe, is what He faced, regardless whether it's the first or second time He went to Gath. These are the things He encountered. Verse 18 is one of the great themes of David's life, is verse 18. The Lord is near to those that have a broken heart. He saves those of the contrite spirit. David loved the doctrine of the broken and the contrite spirit. What, what I mean by this, this is a very, very important theology of David that he brought to the body of Christ. I mean, or to the redeemed community back then. And then, of course, the body of Christ a thousand years after David. He says, let me tell you something. Nearness to God is a reality to anybody that wants it. Instead of the word nearness, it's the idea God will bring into intimacy. Anyone. Anyone, no matter how messed up. David says, I've lost my family. I've lost my friendships. I've lost my economic base. I've lost my ministry. In other words, being king of Israel or his place in the army. And I've lost my fresh walk with God. But one thing I know through all of this, now that I'm restored, God will bring near, He will bring into intimacy the kind of person that will simply say, I'm sorry and I need you, God. He says, I don't care how broken you are, how far you've gone, a broken and a contrite spirit is not some great depth of maturity. That's not what he's talking about. He says, I fell on the ground, this poor man cried, God, I can't live without you. Will you give me a way back? And he says, I tell you, after it's all said and done, there is intimacy for the heart that will say yes to God that can believe that God would actually take them. The problem with most people is in verse 22, David's talking about the unbelievers that are the condemned of the Lord. Believers feeling they're condemned. That's the biggest, is they buy lies about what God's like. David said, I know one thing about God. He differentiates between rebellion and immaturity. David was one of the first to put into writing, into clear, clear thought, the distinction between the rebellious and the immature, one of the great doctrines in the grace of God. God looks at, a, at, a, at an immature man or woman, sincere but immature. The yes in their spirit moves the heart of God, even though their life is broken. I'm not trying to be soft on sin. I'm trying to say this. When you fall and stumble and you know who He is, you run to Him instead of from Him when you know what He looks like. God says, I like a person with a yes in their spirit. You know that the yes in our spirit defines us. It's part of who we are before God. It's not the entirety of who we are before God. Part of our spiritual identity, part of our definition is the yes in our spirit. You know what we define ourselves by? We define ourselves by our struggle, and God defines us by the cry in our heart. We define ourselves by how much victory we attain to, and God cries us by what uh, defines us by what we cry for, what we long for. We've lost it all. We lay in our bed at night. We go, God, I really want you. I know my friends don't believe me. I know the leaders don't believe me. I know nobody believes me. I want you, God. I mean it. I want to get free from this. I don't want to walk into it. I want to walk out of it. I want you. And God defines you by the longings of your heart before Him, not by your track record. That's a radical idea to many, 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 many people. People go, wait a second, wait a second. And, and, and this is something, I don't want to uh, overstate this, but it's something that I have thoroughly researched for 15 years plus in, in the Word of God. It is everywhere that God responds to us according to the cry of our heart. And David was one of the first ones to make it clear. And it's clear all the way through the Scripture. We're so used to the other paradigm of relating to God. We relate to the God on the basis of our current victory, our current track record. When we do good, we feel confidence. When we do bad, we feel condemned. All of that is pride, you know, covert or overt, you know, one way or the other, that we bring something to the table that motivates God to look at us. God says, I'm motivated without your help. You come to the table by my goodness. The cry in your spirit, yes, there's a place where we, we say yes as voluntary lovers of God. And we have to say yes. I do not stand before God and define my life by the last three months of what I've attained. I am defined before God because of who He is, 
what He has said about me and the cry He's put in my heart for Him, that defines me. And when I stumble and I see the weakness of my flesh, you can run to Him instead of from Him if you believe in verse 18. He will bring into intimacy the person with a broken heart over their sin. It's what Jesus, it was scandalous when Jesus talked to the Pharisees about a God who ran to a prodigal son, embraced him, and kissed him, and wept over him. That Jesus talked about a God that runs. A God that embraces, a God that kisses. And they said, no, no, he doesn't do that. There's no Oriental father that would stand up and be moved with longing and run across the field to embrace the son of shame. No, no father would do that. And Jesus says, my father does that. I'm telling you, he saw the heart cry in the prodigal. And the only time God has ever depicted is in a hurry is when he's running to the broken who say yes to him. Every other time God is depicted in perfect patience. He runs for one thing. To the heart that says, I'm yours, and I'll come back. It's the only time the Scripture shows God as in a hurry. And it was the mouth of Jesus revealing His Father, whom He dwelt with from eternity past. Because I'm telling you, my Father runs for one thing. Sinful, broken people that resolve in their heart they want to be God's. He'll run to them. He'll embrace them and He will kiss them when He runs to them. He will be near. He'll kiss them. He'll restore them to intimacy. Oh, if this is David at his best. I mean, I believe David's writing this. He's going, oh, Lord, this is my favorite stuff to write about. He's wanting to teach his children this. He's wanting to teach everyone in the nation this doctrine. It's, it's so uh, obscured in the body of Christ right now. People are so afraid. They go, no, no, no. If you get people that idea, they'll get sloppy with sin. I go, no, that's not true. You don't understand the human makeup. There's such a panging, such a longing for the assurance that we're enjoyed. There's such a desire to be accepted. The opposite is, is rejection. We all know about rejection. We've all experienced it. We all struggle with it. We all have thought residues of it or, or problems with it. But at the very core of the human spirit is the longing for the assurance that you're enjoying. And God says, when I strike that string in their heart, they will run to me, not from me, because I will be the only one to answer the deepest longing in their being, and they will come to me, not from me. I've talked to preachers, they go, you get people so comfortable in sin. I go, no, you're wrong. It, it makes them fierce. It makes them radical. It makes them violent in their pursuit. They go, if God will take me, I'll just be hanging on His leg everywhere He goes. If He'll take me every time, He won't be able to get rid of me. It, it, touch, it, it awakens something. I mean, it's volcanic. Something explodes in our human makeup when we feel enjoyed. No matter how far we go, we look back, we go, wait a second, there's only one place I can get free from the pain. It says, His embrace. He likes me. He likes me. I'm successful in His embrace. And it's too strong in us to overcome the need to be accepted. Well, you can't repent of that. You can try to do it in the wrong way, but David touches that. I mean, David is like a master psychologist under the Holy Spirit's uh, uh, leadership. He says, oh, the brokenhearted, if they'll come, mercy will absolutely overcome them. And David is the picture of that. It's fantastic. Paul the Apostle got accused of false doctrine with this. In Romans chapter 5, verse 20, he says, Where sin abounds, grace is more. People said, what? Where sin abounds, grace is more. He goes, absolutely. Where you sinned a lot, there's more forgiveness and there's more power for deliverance. If you sin a lot, God's embrace will be stronger and His deliverance will be greater to you. Come. And they said in the next verse, or the two verses later, they said in Romans 6, 1, they, they charged Paul. They said, oh, so what, are we going to sin more so we get more grace? Paul says, say what you want. Accuse me what you want. You don't understand. If you touch it, you'd never accuse me of that. Because anybody that touches it never thinks about how to sin more when they touch it. They think about how to give themselves more. It's only the people in, in which that's a theory to. They use it as an excuse. But somebody that touches that in reality, they never dawns on them to sin more, to get more grace. That's only, that's only a, a intellectual a curiosity with the doctrine. But to feel it makes you ravenous for God. And David knew that. That would be, if you had to write one thing over David's life, that would be what made David a worshiper. It's verse 18. He goes, I know, I know fear, I know compromise, I lost everything, I lost my walk with God, my freshness at least, I, I look like I, I forfeited my calling. 
you know what? I came back and I feel God again and He likes me and I want the whole earth to know this. Verse 18. That, that's a good one. Verse 18. That's, the, that's a real key to getting free from fear. Verses 1 to 4. I mean, verse 1 to 3. It's David's personal vow. He wants to bless God night and day. He wants to live perpetually in praise. You look at the monastic movements through history. This Psalm 34, verse 1 is a real big one. They grapple with how can a person live in continual praise? That's uh, Psalm 34, 1 and 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Rejoice always, praise without ceasing. Synonymous ideas. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18. And, and uh, Psalm 34, 1 are the two verses that they would... They would put before God and they would go in a lifelong pursuit. How can we live constantly in praise? We're not going to slander. We're not, we don't want to ever one more time complain. We want to live in constant praise before God. And, and, and a whole orders would be built around the pursuit of living in constant communion based on gratitude from, from Psalm 34. And I tell you, that's this kind of commitment David made is not based on discipline. This thing is based on gratitude. You can never discipline yourself into that response, but with revelation and gratitude, you can move more powerfully into that reality. It's based on gratitude. So David lays before it. He goes, I want to continually, continually, continually. I don't want to let go of it. I don't want to ever slip back into the old way again. Well, we do know that he did because he went to Gath, came back and wrote it, and then he went to Gath again a few years later. And we'll look at what he wrote uh, in a week or two after his second visit to Gath. It's powerful. It's, it's, it's wonderful. It's Psalm 56. It's powerful. He said, my tears of struggle are captured in God's bottle. All of my tears of my wondering and all my brokenness, God didn't write me off. He stored all my tears. He put them and scooped them and stored them in His bottle because He loves me. Psalm 56, verse 8. That's what He said after His next visit to Gath. Say, David understood something, didn't he? But you know what? By the grace of God, we're going to understand it. We're going to go drink somewhere different. And, and when we drink different, we're not going to boast about it. We're going to in humility serve and bring other people to the well. We're not going to bring them to us. We're going to bring them to a well. Because they can't get it from you. They can't get it from me. They can't get it from a prophet. They have to go to the well. Verse 4 to 7, really good. David lays out the, his struggle. He lays out the divine and human interaction in verse 4 to 7. He says what he did and he says what God did. He says, God does one part, we do another part. God will not do your part and you can't do His part. God will not do your part and you cannot do His part. I love to talk about the cooperation and the grace of God. Human part and the divine part. We change our mind, He changes our emotions. That's a real simple way to say it. God will not change your mind. You have to change your mind. You cannot change your emotions. God can, though. He can reconstruct your emotional chemistry little by little. He does it. It's called sanctification. You feel different at the end of the day. And I'm not saying it's all about feelings, but feelings are impacted. I love the analogy. I've used it for years about the farmer who took the preacher home to his farm and they drove up in this beautifully manicured farm. I mean, his acres of this rolling beauty and everything in its place. And the preacher said, boy, God sure blessed you with this farm. And the farmer says, well, preacher, he says, when God had this farm, it was a mess. Preacher didn't really appreciate how much work the farmer did. And there's a cooperation. God produces the principle of life in the seed, and God produces the sun and the rain. But the farmer has to plow the ground, put the seed in it, and he has to water it, and he has to weed it. And God... God is the one that put the principle of life. And without that principle of life, I don't care how hard that farmer worked, nothing would grow. But I don't care how much life is in the seed, if the farmer doesn't plow the ground and weed it, there's not going to be a harvest. There's a human side, there's a divine side, there's a, there's a, a division of labor that is divinely designed with wisdom. 
David lays it out in verse 4 to 7. He says, I sought the Lord. My part, I go after Him. I search for Him. I seek Him. God's part is He answers me when I seek Him. God waits. It says in Isaiah uh, chapter 30, verse 18, God waits. And he hides Himself until He hears the cry of His people that He answers. God waits up there. And we're hurting, we're hurting, we're hurting. He says, I want you to lift your voice. Why do you want me to lift my voice? Because if you cry out to me, then you will make the connection in your thinking that when you move towards me, I move towards you. And when that connection is made in your thinking, it will really draw you into my, my closer to me. When the invisible God does things, when we say things, we say it's called prayer, we speak. He's invisible, and all of a sudden things are different. We go, wait a second. He's real. When I do this, he does that. He says, you got it. That's why, I, that's why I'm not going to answer you until you, until you ask. I want you to connect the idea, when you move to me, I move to you. Of course, we understand God's the one that moved first. God moved us originally, and then we respond to the leadings of the grace of God, and then God responds to our response. It's really a three-step process. God moves on us when we've never thought. Of anything about Him. He moves on us. Our heart strangely warm, John Wesley said. And then we move to God after that response. And then God moves in response to our response. And David understands. He goes, if I don't, if I don't move to Him, for He's touched me, He said, He doesn't move closer to me because He doesn't want me to understand life works without moving into the heart of God. It's about intimacy. The, the Creator is into intimacy. He's a lover. He's not just a Creator. He's not just wise. He is a lover at the core of who He is. So He wants His power to be administrated in a way that brings His creation into His heart. He's, that's called prayer. That's the genius of God in prayer. He's like a great wisdom, a great power, but I am going to display it to you and through you in a way that moves you into love. I want you... I'm a lover first. I'm not just an artist that paints the skies. I'm not just an architect that can build the heavens. I'm a lover first. I'm going to display my wisdom and my power in a way that makes you love. So he said, here's what I'll do. I won't do it until you reach towards me. When you reach towards me, I'll say, come on, reach more. And just that, that reaching, and then I will answer, and then things will change in you. And then you'll say, wait a second, prayer makes a difference. Well, really, it's the moving towards God. God waits till you move towards Him, then He moves to you so that you connect with it. David understood that. He goes, he's... I'm going to move to God. Somebody says, well, I don't feel Him. Yes, you do. Yes, you do feel Him. He says, no, I don't. The very fact that you would have anguish in your heart is the very work of God in love sickness in you already. The fact that some of you are sitting there going, I can't stand listening to this guy. This is killing me. I, I, I feel so distant. My heart is so cold. I don't love the Word. There's no movement of God in my soul. I, I can't bear it. The very fact that you can't bear it is the beginning of love sickness in you. Because the unbeliever thinks that this stuff is just foolish and totally boring. To you that are stuck, it's painful because you're lovesick at the very beginning stages. See, before you met the Lord, this would have been folly to you and totally boring. You'd say, like, man, I'm just like, I gotta shut up. Maybe so, <laughs> never mind. And so, uh, but you're sitting there, some of you, in pain. I tell you, the mark, that pain is the mark of God's thumbprint on your heart already. You never had that pain before. Where'd that come from? It's not from the devil, and it's certainly not from your sinful flesh. That pain is a longing that's got a hold of you that won't let go. That's good. That's where it begins. It begins with the pain, that unrelenting ache of desire. Oh, God, I can't stand not feeling and having and flowing in this. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. The Lord says, come on, keep coming, keep coming. You need to recognize that as grace. God's moving on you. Now He says, move to me now. Don't let that pain just dissipate. Let it drive you into the fire of God. Number one, David says, I saw it and God answers. He goes, I looked. I looked and God releases radiance. I looked to Him. And, and there's five things He did. He saw it. He looked. He cried. He feared the Lord. Only four, isn't it? Well, there's only four things there. Okay, there you go. <clears throat> God releases radiance in the lives of the people in time. Not immediately, but in time. He illuminates. We look and He illuminates. 
We cry and He saves. We fear the Lord and God surrounds us with angelic help, with supernatural, supernatural help. And a lot of the supernatural help that He surrounds us with, we can't see. The right hand and the left hand of God. The right hand is the things we observe, discern. The left hand is the activity of God that's undiscernible to the human heart. But it's all there. It's upholding all the time and moving and acting. It's, it's releasing and hindering things that keep our life in order that we know nothing about. The left hand of God. The undiscernible but very powerful activity. I tell you, we fear the Lord. He surrounds us with the right and the left hand. What I want to say to you is this. David is telling the people, he says, I went through fear. I lost my job. I lost my relationships. I lost my family. I lost my ministry. I lost my freshness with God. I sinned. I grieved God. And I want to tell you, I, got, I had the courage to stand and to seek, to cry out, to fear the Lord again, and to look to Him. He became radiant. My heart was illumined again. I found answers. I saw the, the hand of God surround me in a new way. He goes, I'm telling you, it will work if you will do it. David's laying it out, line upon line. Then verse 8 to 10, he really, he really uh, wants uh, to make it personal. He tells them, he says, try it, test the Lord. There's two times in the scripture we can test the Lord, we can test Him with money. You can give money to God, and he says, I'll give you power encounters and finances. I will surprise you. I'll do things you wouldn't imagine I would do in money areas. You can test Him in money, and you can test Him in seeking Him. David's saying it right there, taste and see. He goes, you can try and test the Lord in this. Go after Him and see if He won't unfold Himself to you in time. Verse 8 to 10, he's telling people to experience it to the degree they want it. Taste and see. Taste and see, he's saying, experiential knowledge is within your reach. Experiential knowledge, taste and see. God wants you to taste the pleasure of Him. He goes, go after it for a while. I just want to throw just a little bit out to you. Get a little, just get a little bit of understanding that God likes you when you're immature. So you get the condemnation, that confusion, a little bit minimized and out of the way. Because with a, a paradigm of God that He's mad at you all the time, you can't taste Him. You have to get an idea that He likes you when you're reaching to Him when you're young in the, in the things of the Lord. That's, that's essential, number one. Open your Bible, turn down just a little bit of the recreation and and entertainment. Throw in just a little bit of fasting here and there. Just bear the silence for a little while. Just do it for maybe a couple months or a year or two. And at the end of 70 years, you tell me if that season, that year or two, didn't change your life. The Lord says, you taste and see. Come after. Come after and you will. You will taste and see. You will touch it and you will experience it. I didn't say you'd get it in six weeks. and I didn't say it. You would get it. Your life would be radically transformed with a feeble attempt. You come after it hard. Even in a feeble way, but as hard as you know. And the Lord says, I'll move you forward in this thing. And David had the confidence to tell him to do it. He tells him in verse 8 to 10, four things again. He says, taste, trust, fear the Lord, and enjoy the Lord. Taste the Lord. Come and experience the pleasure of it. He tells him to trust the Lord, fear the Lord, and then enjoy the Lord. In other words, he says, be satisfied. You'll have no, you, you will be satisfied at the end of the day. Satisfaction guaranteed. Verse 10, David says, when the young lions who are hungry come after you. <laughs> See, David had a bunch of young lions after him. They were Saul's soldiers and the Philistine soldiers. They had lions coming after him. And he said, uh, just like the lions, and lions were common in Israel. He said, just like the lions all around. He says, they get hungry and they want to be fed. When the lions are coming after me in my, in my life. He says, I found this to be fail-proof at the end of the day. And then verse 11 to 22, he kicks out of a biographical, autobiographical mode into a teaching mode. I'm just going to just give a, a brief summary. You can follow out the themes yourself. Verses 12 to 14, or actually, it's, yeah, 12 to 14, you know the verse thing, David, you could almost predict it. When David's talking, it's either going to be mercy or it's going to be your speech. First thing, he says, okay, kids, let's line it up. He goes, let's, do, let's talk about speech. Again, I think the whole, not the whole approach, but I think some of the approach to bridling our tongue is a wrong approach. It's not just about integrity. We, I think that 
we've taken too uh, possibly idealistic of a route to teaching people to bridle their tongue. We tell them integrity. Well, they think, well, I probably won't get caught if I whisper because the guy doesn't have a track record in telling people. Anyway, the integrity thing doesn't normally hold people. David's appealing to something else. This is your life will work. If you'll interface with God, you'll be surprised what you find out. You'll be surprised what you walk in. And that's, I believe, what David's paradigm was. That when you, when you don't vent, you boil inside and you have to get comfort and it drives you into God. When you drive into God, you find out new information about God and life and you. And then your need to vent has changed. And David says, don't go to, don't let the, don't let the pressure off. Don't go vent. Interface, interact with God. You'll come with a totally different philosophy. Because the pain of not venting will make you vent to God. And I tell you, when you vent to God, not only will He change the circumstances, He will change the way you view life. Because the pain of it will be like power pushing you into God. But we go for those little cheap band-aids. I've done it plenty of times. And plenty of times I've done it to the Lord. And I know a little bit about this. I want to know more about it. But he says a very key principle. He goes, who's the man that desires life? Who's the man that loves many days that he would see good? He says, who's the guy that wants to enter into life and to see goodness? Look what he says. He links that verse 13. to talking right. He goes, you want to enter into life? He goes, I know something that will power drive you into the heart of God. Don't distort your speech. Don't present yourself as the victim or the hero. Don't change the circumstance. Just don't be a victim and go tell people how bad they did it. Don't be the hero that saves the day. Don't get your reward from people. Let the power, the drive to get your reward just burn in you and drive you into God. And he says, it will drive you to God. He says, and you will see good days. And you will see life flow to you like you've never tried before. One of the greatest powers we have in us is the urge to relieve the pain of our life. And God says, use that urge to relieve your pain to drive you into God and don't vent it. And I'm telling you, you will see good days. In other words, the anointing, the, the spirit of intimacy will begin to touch you. It's one of the most powerful urges that we have. God designed it so that we would help us with Him. And He says, just, you just waste it. You just waste it. You just uh, cause it to be dissipated, all the thing that was driving you to my heart. Isn't that interesting? The very first thing David touches is the issue of speech. And again, he's not talking about integrity. He's talking about that power, that urge in our heart to, to look good and to get things right. And he's saying, use it to drive you into God. But what we do, we all do it. I've done it many times. We tell the story. We're the victim that's being mistreated. We try to rally support, or we're the hero that saved the day so that people like us and they are endeared to us. And the Lord says, don't cheat. Quit doing that. Take that urge and come to me. I'll give you life. And then you won't need to do it that way. And that's one of the great uh, themes in the life of David. In every psalm, he talks about the tongue every time. That was the thing that I talked about last week. He was so wise about. Verse 15 and 16, the sovereignty of God. God's looking. His eyes, his ears, his face. He's attentive. It's David's revelation of the sovereignty of God. Verse 18, 17 and 18, it's that mercy of God, his life message, the great discovery after Gath. God likes immature, broken people that have a yes in their spirit. That's his great life message, 17 and 18. God will help you. He'll be near to you if you'll just say yes to Him. Don't let condemnation shut you down. Run to Him. He said the same thing after He killed Uriah, after He murdered Uriah. Psalm 51, verse 17. The sacrifices that God wants is a broken and contrite heart. He wants a yes in your spirit. He doesn't want you to try to go to more prayer meetings to even the score or give to missions to even the score or witness to a few people to even the score. He wants you falling down saying, I have no thing to bring. Except for I just want you. Will you have me? God says, that I will operate with. Verse 17 and 18. That's his life message. And then verses 19 and 20, he talks about the, the power of pressure. He says, God's going to use pressure to make you better. That was one of David's many themes. He goes, pressure will make you better. It drives you into God. If you don't, if you don't waste the energy that pressure produces in your heart. 
Don't look for false props. Be driven into God. David's talking about that right there. It's one of his great doctrines. And he talks about the futility of sin. I like verse 21. It's really interesting. He says, the evil shall slay the wicked. Evil shall slay the wicked. When we play around with sins, it's not that God has to come and break us. Sin breaks us. God could say, could take a step back and sin's punishment is resident in the sin itself. The punishment of sin in a believer is resident in the sin itself because it causes us to lose life. There are circumstantial uh, disciplines God will bring. He will cause some circumstances to be hard, harder sometimes, but sin brewing in our members because we yield to it is its punishment. He says, oh, you have such beauty and such potential, and yet you dissipate all of your affections and all of your life in these things. The, the, the destroyers of righteousness are self-destroyed. God's uh, administration of the universe is such, the people that destroy righteousness, they destroy themselves by destroying righteousness. It's that the great sin of the human race is spiritual suicide. They literally kill themselves spiritually. It is suicide on a mass level. Saying no to God is self-induced spiritual suicide. That is, it killed, the penalty of it is that we kill ourselves by doing it. And then he says, verse 22, he says, hey, get this thing straight. If you're of the Lord, you're, you're of the redeemed. He's paid for you. You're not one of the condemned. He comes back to one of his great themes. You're of the redeemed. You're not of the, of the condemned. Condemnation is one of the big hindrances. It stops us all the time. <clears throat> one of David's you know, real passions was to hinder condemnation. Amen. Let's stand. Well, I think that it's, it's good not to slander for integrity reasons. I just don't see most people, I just didn't hold most people in place. But if you know that you can receive more of the glory of God by not slandering, you think, why am I doing it for that reason? <laughs> if I can get more pleasure by not talking, in the end, that's how, I, that's how I approach it. I know it's better if I talk right. And integrity, but I know I will find God if, that, if I use that pressure to drive me into Him. And I don't do it all the time. I don't want to present that. I sin in that area. But I've done it a number of times, and I have discovered things that surprise me. A little bit more of the big picture comes into place. You go, yeah, that's cool. That's not such a big deal anyway that the guy's ripping me off, is he? He goes, nah, not really. It's not that big of a deal. Not really. Wow, the scheme is really big. They seem really small now. Lord, we love you. Oh, God, we love you. No one but you, Lord, can satisfy the longing in my heart. Nothing I do can take the place of drawing near to you. Only you can fill my deepest longing. That's it right there. Only you can breathe in me new love. Only you can fill my heart with laughter. Lord, just a little bit, we believe that you could satisfy us. We believe it a little bit. Now draw us into you, God. Just a little bit, we believe this, Lord. But that's good enough to start. There's a river of pleasure that David talked about. 
Water with the river of pleasure. Breathing me new life. Only you can fill my heart with laughter. Only you can answer my heart. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.